Hello, everybody. Uh, I'm John Sullivan. I'm the executive director at the Free Software Foundation. Um, I want to start by saying that I am not a lawyer, and I am definitely not anybody here's lawyer. Uh, and that will become readily apparent anyway as I address the topics in this talk. Um, we're going to talk about the AGPL primarily from a, a policy perspective. Um, I think licenses obviously are very important in the way that they actually function in court and in the law, but they also serve as important statements of mutual purpose, set ground rules for cooperation. Um, and that's one reason I've always really appreciated this dev room is because it's the uh, licensing, licensing and legal and policy dev room that acknowledges those two purposes together. I'm also feeling a little bit guilty slash embarrassed about kind of pulling a BuzzFeed title for the presentation here. At least it's not uh, five things you'll be shocked to learn about the AGPL or something like that. <laughs> I, I will try to, to deliver here. Uh, and I want to thank you to say, say thanks to Tom, Bradley, Karen, and uh, Fontana for putting this together year after year. Uh, I really appreciate the chance to speak here on behalf of the Free Software Foundation. And I also hope to see everybody on Monday at CopyLeft Conf. Um, I'll be talking about a uh, different network freedom related issue, which is uh, proprietary JavaScript and copyleft JavaScript, which Karen and Bradley also talked about at the keynote this morning. So uh, partly because of my own inadequacies uh, and partly because of events that have happened since I submitted this proposal back in November, um, I can't actually cover everything that I put in the abstract in 25 minutes. <laughs> Um, I am here, most importantly, to talk about why people should use the HEPL, um, who out there is saying otherwise, and uh, why I think many of the criticisms that we're hearing lately are, are basically off the mark, uh, and that some of the efforts that we're seeing to, to start drafting new licenses to address similar problem areas as what the HEPL seeks to tackle uh, are premature. That being said, I also think the FSF should take some responsibility for the current state of affairs and these things happening because I don't think that we've been out there advocating enough for this license or uh, building up the materials um, to help people use it. And that's something that I intend to try and change. I think we have been um, working on that already. And I'm hoping that some of you will help us do that. You know, the resources that you see that are on GNU.org for GPL grew up over many years and were informed by many of the questions that we were sent by the public, many of the lawyers that we've worked with over the years. Uh, and we want to put more focus along those lines on the AGPL. And I hope by doing that, we'll actually come to understand where some legitimate issues might be, how we might want to fix them, whether they can be fixed through uh, publications about the intention behind particular wordings or whether we do need to um, draft new licenses or new versions of licenses. Uh, it's also kind of a pet topic of mine is that I'm very concerned about sort of self-fulfilling prophecies in our community. When people say things like copyleft is declining, nobody's using the GPL, or nobody's using the AGPL, uh, those things can actually become the factor that drives people away from using those things. You know, those statements are acts, and um, a lot of people out there make their decisions based on wanting to go with the flow and be a good collaborator. And I think that can cause... Um, negative effects, and I think that's happening to some extent with the AGPL. So that's why, you know, part of this, I saw uh, uh, Karen give a, a great keynote years ago called Stand Up for the GPL, um, and I'm hoping that those of you who support the AGPL and use it for your projects or enjoy using AGPL software will stand up for the AGPL and help push back against this claim that um, people aren't using it or that it's not a, a license that helps protect freedom on the network. So and that's the short statement of how the AGPL differs from the GPL. Uh, it's not only triggered by distribution, but by uh, running a service with a uh, modified program over the network. This is the full legal code for that. A clause like this was originally part of early drafts of GPLv3, uh, well, at the very early part, and it was dropped in order to build consensus around GPLv3 and be able to move forward with that. We kept AGPL and the AFERO clause as a separate license. Uh, and obviously from the title of this talk, uh, I'm saying that there are people out there claiming that nobody is using the AGPL, but in fact, everyone and their dependencies are using the AGPL. Um, I won't give the source till you're done reading, but this article says that 13.5% of code bases contained AGPL-like license components. 
and that the uh, use of the AGPL has ramped by almost an order of magnitude. So these numbers come from Black Duck, who uh, we can't put too much confidence in, and I've, I've criticized their publications about the use of copyleft because their data is not published, the software they use to count licenses is not published, and nobody can verify the results because you can't reproduce the experiment, essentially. But people quote Black Duck numbers at us all the time about how copyleft and GPL are declining, so the AGPL, according to Black Duck, is increasing. <laughs> I am also going to walk through a few of my favorite um, AGPL projects, just to back that up a little bit more. Um, one of my favorites was when the Department of Defense chose the AGPL for one of their projects as part of their um, uh, big push into free software. And they chose HGPL v3 or later for this web-based uh, service that helps manage legal proceedings within the military, so court martials and things like that. And what's cool about that is not only that it's AGPL and that it's free software, but their, their reason for doing it is because this is software that's used within a court proceeding where people's lives, you know, careers are at stake. And they said that everybody in that process needs to have a right to see how the data is being handled by the software and the only license that could guarantee that for a network service or help that for the network service is the AGPL. Lots of other projects use the AGPL. Uh, CIVI CRM, which is the donor database system used by the FSF, Wikimedia, EFF, uh, lots of other people around the world. Poll.is, I just learned about recently as a very cool piece of software for organizing conversations about contentious issues um, used by governments like Canada, Taiwan, universities like Columbia. Mailpile, a uh, webmail client aiming at user-friendly, fast interface with encryption. Mastodon, people might have heard of that recently, right? GNU Social, which is kind of the predecessor to Mastodon and still in its own right, uh, a player in the decentralized social networking space. GNU Media Goblin and PixelFed, both uh, free software and media sharing platforms. Berkeley DB, Pelican, a static site generator, and I wanted to highlight that um, one thing I'm going to touch on is the way debates about license choices are happening within projects, and Pelican has a, a bug, an issue open, where people are trying to persuade them to switch away from the AGPL. Other people are arguing against that. That's an example of conversations I'm going to talk more about in a few minutes. Next cloud, calendaring, notes, uh, contact management. You can sync with your phone. Uh, pretty much a full replacement for Google Cloud or iCloud. F-Droid server. So if you have an Android phone, you can get only free software applications. The server side is AGPL. Anki, which is a pet favorite project of mine for flashcards. It's responsible for my terrible German. Um, but the <laughs> software is great. Get Annex, distributed file synchronization. Uh, so there's, there's so many more. I mean, there's uh, GNU Net, there's, uh, which recently changed AGPL. There's Dev Sources, which has been an uh, incredibly important tool for analyzing and searching all the source code in Debian. Um, the web UI for the Software Heritage Project that was mentioned on this panel was AGPL. Um, uh, sorry, wait. Oh, that's terrible. <laughs> Uh, sorry, I've, I've just received news that MongoDB is no longer under the AGPL. <laughs> Thanks, Richard. Um, I also need to highlight that I did not do my due diligence in diving into these projects. There are other factors in their governance and uh, structures which may matter. So some of these projects may have CLAs, um, which may undermine the usefulness of the AGPL and could be objectionable in their own right. The fact remains that they do all publish AGPL versions that are forkable uh, under that license. So, um, oh, I also forgot to mention that searching for repositories on GitHub that are licensed under the AGPL uh, returns 70,003 results, uh, excluding known forks. <clears throat> so, why and uh, when to use the AGPL. People often write free software, particular copyleft software, because they want their code to be shared, right? So it was a rude awakening when um, technology developed such that companies uh, were able to take that code and run services, including modified versions of that software, without providing the source code as copyleft would normally require you to do. 
Uh, many businesses were also bothered by this, and not just individual developers, uh, because it's sort of a betrayal of the copyleft bargain and undermine that sense of shared purpose um, that I talked about at the very beginning. Uh, you can see that this is a very moderate recommendation of the AGPL. And it says, uh, we recommend using the GNU or Faro GPL as a license for programs often used on servers. Um, the reason this is a very mild recommendation for a specific situation is because we, we want to be very careful not to overpromise what the AGPL can achieve because there are so many freedom and ethical issues involved in network services and, and computing on the network that are uh, about more than the license of the software. Um, so we want to be careful about that. But I would still, you know, personally argue for a very expansive definition of programs often used on servers because a program that today doesn't seem to be useful on a server can very easily turn out next year to be uh, part of someone's server offering, and that, that happened in the past. Who would have thought that GNU units was a program that would be used on a server? But now most search engines, if you type something into the search bar about a conversion, will return a result, you know, inches to centimeters, and likely that many of those are using a program like units on the back end. Uh, so, but to understand this a little bit better, I like to, to start with what the AGPL does not help with. Um, I mentioned that basket of issues that relate to network freedom. So even if the software is AGPL, if it's on someone else's server and you don't have access to that, you don't have the ability to add your own, modif to make your own modifications on that server, um, you still don't have freedom, right? The server operator has freedom, you don't have uh, freedom. It doesn't solve the problem of uh, service as a software substitute, or so sorry, so yes, service as a software substitute if you're using somebody else's server to edit your photos, make your documents, you still don't have control over the software that um, you're using to do those things. Uh, similarly, the AGPL does not ensure that the uh, server operator will do a good job keeping up with security patches, does not ensure that the server operator will not do other sorts of bad things, like run a program that logs all the traffic on the server, totally separate from the AGPL work, and do something bad with your data. Uh, so this license is not going to help with, with those things. And it's not gonna stop big companies from running your software because like any free software license, which respects freedom zero and allows commercial activity, uh, part of the bargain is allows other people to use that work commercially. The benefit is it's reciprocal um, and the potential is always there for other people to do the same thing. What the AGPL does help with uh, portability and decentralization. So a lot of the problems that we face in the current network world have to do with monopolies and silos, you know, the Facebooks uh, of the world. AGPL is part of the solution for addressing this because it allows multiple operators to run the same platform. Users can move from one to the other when they don't like um, particular bits of bad behavior in each place. Uh, did I just put this on the doesn't help with list? But I think the AGPL can help with these things. Um, it can help with security because if we believe that free software is a precondition to genuine security, then a server operator that publishes their source code and invites people to inspect it and accepts patches and applies them should be in a better security position than a server operator that does not do that. Uh, likewise, other kinds of bad behavior, bad privacy policies can be checked by the decentralization and silo effect because if users don't like Facebook's new privacy policy and they have the option to move to another Facebook-like thing with all of their data, uh, they would be able to do that. And just like free software um, in the traditional sense checks distribution of malware um, or inclusion of malware, the same thing can happen on the network. So it does help with those things. We just need to be very careful not to overpromise that it solves for them because other steps are required. Security patches have to be applied, you know, and uh, there has to be options to get the data out, not just the software, et cetera. And, uh, don't forget that using HPL means you're, you're contributing free software back to the community and, and step away from assessing that one service. And remember that free software can be repurposed in other ways beyond what it was originally written for. So anybody who is publishing their code under the HPL is already doing a positive thing, um, even if they're not providing the best data portability or something like that, because they're making an active contribution to the free software community. They're respecting their users, and that helps uh, advance free software as a whole. So critics of the AGPL who might disagree with some of these things, well, 
Uh, some argue that the AJPL is too strong. Um, how many people have seen this policy before? Okay. Well, it doesn't get much clearer. <laughs> Google's policy says, uh, warning, code licensed under the GNU Feral General Public License may not be used at Google. May not in capitals. Uh, the reason seems to be because um, they are worried that the HPL is so potentially strong or expansive that it could force them to accidentally have to publish unpublished software or uh, publish proprietary software under a free license. Uh, but it goes so far as to say, do not install HPL license programs on your workstation, Google-issued laptop, or Google-issued phone without explicit authorization. Uh, so. Don't even think about Nextcloud. You know, don't even think about any of those programs that we listed before. Uh, but it goes a little bit deeper than this. So in fact, uh, Google employees have directly asked authors of AGPL programs to relicense their work. This is a quote from Joey Hess, uh, somebody that I look up to uh, quite a bit in free software. He's done a lot of amazing work, uh, saying that he's been approached several times uh, by Google employees who would like to use the software, asking him to change the license. Um, this doesn't mean that this is an official Google policy or that these people were acting with, uh, you know, under the direction of, of somebody, but Google employees apparently asked him to do this. Also, to Google's credit and these employees' credit, they were asking him to switch to the GPL, which is still a copyleft license, um, rather than to a lax permissive license, but uh, still, it's pressure against um, a clause which accomplishes important things for user freedom. So I also read this policy as a challenge to uh, software developers out there, that part of why Google, Google's policy says the risks outweigh the benefits. So I take this as a challenge for everybody to write more and better software under the AGPL, make those benefits greater, and make these policies have to be reconsidered. <laughs> On the other side, we have the AGPL is too weak. Uh, so the little MongoDB joke, um, MongoDB uh, has come around, you know, they're, they're feeling, uh, they've been a very important and popular HGPL project for quite a while, um, and they've recently decided that they think they need a new license, the server-side public license, because they think that enforcement of the AGPL against people they think are violating it would be too expensive uh, and difficult. And if you look at the wording of the new license, they seem to want more of the software related to the application to have to be released. Uh, I'll talk more about that in a second. But fundamentally, this seems to be an argument throughout the AGPL is, is too weak. It's either too weak because it's difficult to enforce or too weak because it doesn't have a strong enough copyleft clause to require publication of more of the key elements. So they feel that um, some competitors or people are taking away their business by offering MongoDB in a, in a service setting without um, having to contribute back. So that gives us uh, a few, it's not just MongoDB, there's been a couple others that are publishing new licenses or new license clauses in order to try to address competition from what they call you know, cloud offerings. Uh, the server-side public license still wants to be a free license. It's been submitted to OSI for approval. OSI, FSF are still you know, discussing the license. Um, but their goal seems to be to still have a free and um, open license. Uh, UBOS and Redis took a different approach. They are very upfront in saying that their versions are to address some similar issues are not free. They're both essentially non-commercial clauses. So in UBOS's case, the personal public license says that you need to ask for permission as an organization to use the software as an individual. You can continue to use it under the GPL. And Redis, as uh, Chris talked about earlier, uses the Commons Clause plus Apache to essentially make a uh, non-commercial requirement. So, you know, we can see that one of the main reasons that some, some people out there don't want you to use the AGPL for your software is because they might want to use your software, and using your AGPL software might require them to release some of their proprietary or unreleased software, which is often uh, serves as a software substitute. Another reason is that the AGPL isn't working well enough for helping them make money. So, you know, besides the fact that I think some of these criticisms are um, questionable 
on face, there's also the issue of having different goals. And so, you know, this is our goal, right? We're, we're trying to make a world where all software is free software. You just can do everything they need to do with free software. And at the same time, we're working on, on developing, you know, what are the standards for freedom on the network? Uh, just like we have the four freedoms for free software. I think there are successful business models under the AGPL, and I, I enjoy discussing them, but those business models need to be framed within the ground rules that respect this uh, larger goal. They also, on the other side, need to respect freedom zero, and this is um, why I think the Afero Clause didn't go further to begin with, is because the freedom to run software on your own server um, without being forced to publish things uh, is part of freedom zero. And we have to find you know, that balance, that intersection where it uh, makes sense to um, ask server operators to contribute code back when they are actually, they're not distributing, but they are offering a public service or service to customers and the you know, dystopian opposite of forcing you to publish your thoughts or to you know, publish your software um, just because you wrote it and have it on your hard drive. Like that's, that's not right either, right? So we have to, to navigate between those two things. On the enforcement topic, all I want to say is that uh, you know, any license with a copy left clause is going to require enforcement in order to make it effective. Um, we hope that all enforcement will be done in accordance with the principles of committee-oriented GPL enforcement, which I think work just as well for the AGPL. Uh, and you know, I'm not sure that adding more requirements to a license is a way to address enforcement concerns. Um, I think companies should be, first of all, funding the enforcement efforts done by nonprofits. Uh, the enforcement done by Conservancy, by the FSF, helps create a norm and a culture where people follow the licenses, and that will benefit you know, other copyleft holders as well. Um, and I think companies should consider working with nonprofits or reconsider the model of whether they have to be the copyright owners of the software just because they're generating a business around it. Those two things don't necessarily have to be uh, to go together. And I think there's companies out there that, uh, that have viable business models around software they don't hold the copyright to that's free software. That's part of the point, right? Uh, so I'm going to ask you to help um, in several ways here. You know, first of all, freedom first, money second. Um, like I said, you know, the <laughs> thanks, Karen. <laughs> um, we got two. We got three. We have a movement, right? <laughs> Yeah, uh, we want commercial activity to be welcome in the free software community. It's important. Um, in fact, any you know, attempt to prohibit commercial activity is against the principles of software freedom, but the ground rules for respecting freedom are just that. They're the ground rules. Uh, money comes after that. The challenge is to find ways to have viable businesses within those parameters. And don't forget that it's those ground rules that created all the software to begin with. And right? so it gets suspicious when people sort of try to kick the ladder away, um, take what was created, and then uh, follow different rules going forward. Use the AGPL v3 for your software uh, or any later version. If you don't trust the FSF, uh, you can specify a proxy option who can make the decision. Um, but as, I'm, as I was alluding to earlier, if there are issues and we do need to release new issues of the license, um, it's helpful if you have already given permission to go along with that or given an organization permission to make the decision about whether a new version of license published is good for the project. Use the SNAZI logo. Uh, be visible. Like I said, if you're out there um, using the AGPL, using AGPL software or even better, writing it, um, talk about that. Participate in some of the comment threads that are out there um, arguing about licensing choices. And please, if your employer has a, a licensing policy or a product that's licensed in a way that's inconsistent with a copyleft license or with the AGPL, please don't go to projects and ask the projects to change their license so that you can use them at work. Um, I know it's awesome to use free software at work, and we want everybody to be able to do that, and I have deep empathy for that. But try to change your employer's licensing policy rather than asking every free software project to become a permissively licensed project so that it can be used in the, in the product that you're working on. Uh, and fork when necessary. Uh, and thanks to Chris for uh, being part of the effort, Chris Lamb for being part of the effort on that with uh, the Commons Clause Redis Labs modules. Here's a pipe dream of mine. Choose a license.com. Can we get AGPL on the front page? Uh, here's my first stab at suggested text that fits in with the other licenses that are listed there. It is a qualitatively different license um, that addresses different concerns that aren't currently addressed by any of the offerings that are there now. 
Also, I just noticed today that Apache is no longer on the front page. I don't know when that happened. Uh, but this one talked about self-fulfilling prophecies earlier. Um, Choosealicense.com is really, you know, has a big influence on what licenses people choose for their project. It's one of the first things they see. We're here to help you. I, I admitted at the beginning that we haven't done as much as we could have, but we are here to help. And if you have questions about the AGPL, uh, please write to us, licensing at fsf.org. Thank you. I can say one. I'm, I'm at time, right? But, uh. We've got a couple of minutes for questions. Way in the back. So it's an opportunity for me to work out. <laughs> Uh, thanks for the talk. What's your opinion on lesser HEPL or LHEPL? I mean, it's not like official license, but I see it pretty often. Yeah, I, um, I think that, uh, that's a, I'm, I personally think it's a good idea, and I would like to see us um, get some of the people who have also told me that they think it's a good idea. I would like to get some of those people together um, and start talking about how to move forward with, uh, with it and what kind of drafting process might be appropriate. Hi, thanks for your talk. Are there measures in AGPL to force or at least encourage network operators to be transparent about the changes they, made, they make on the, the software that they are serving? To the customers, like as a software user, as a, like a Mastodon user, how can I know that this, the network operator has changed the software in the server. Can AGPL help me in that, with this? Um, so not just by being a license. Um, there may be some sort of technical things you can build in. If you're the author of an AGPL program, some technical things you may be able to build in to help you recognize when software has been altered. But that kind of gets back to that list of things the AGPL doesn't solve. You're still trusting the software operator. Um, but you know that's not that different to me than GPL compliance in general because uh, how many of us get a binary and then get what a company claims to be source code and sort of assume they're the same thing? Uh, we, and without reproducible builds, you can't 100% verify that either. So it's kind of a similar dynamic. Um, I know as if, were, if you were able to get a legal process to start, then there would be legal tools available to you know, find out what was actually running on the on the server, so at some point that information would, would become known. But yet, yeah, up front, you know, whatever the server, they have total control of the software, so you can put some hash there, they can just change the hash. Right? So. Okay, two questions. I recently saw that a program that was proprietary for a long time became re-licensed under the HPL. Hmm. So there are still people who are used the license. Yeah, that's very. Do you remember the project? It is a small program, but it, I think it, it, this one is important for the free software and accessibility. Awesome. Okay. Uh, one good news is always nice. Really quick question, because I promised one last one. Hold on a second. Thank you. Uh, when I've tried to use the AGPL, the legal counsel I've received is that the redistribution clause, the copyleft clause, is too vague and it's hard to figure out the parameters around when it applies. And in reading, it looks like that was, some people see that as one of the goals of the license is to keep that really vague and, and potentially expansive to the point where the microblog uh, or the <coughs> static page generator you mentioned, it was the content that's that's written in that system under the G AGPL, how, how can we describe where the limits are so that we can reduce that FUD and, and help people feel comfortable using it, feeling like it's, that they can understand the consequences? Yeah, I, I, I understand where that's coming from. And I think that one of the things that we need is a better, so right now we have a few questions about the AGPL and the GPL FAQ. And I think we need to build out a more developed list of questions about the AGPL specifically. Um, again, some of these questions are very similar to the questions about what, what makes a derivative work. 
when you're distributing something covered under the GPL that you've modified. And the FSF does want to help people, does want to help people get a clear understanding about that. Um, there's also, you know, to be fair, only so far that we should go in helping proprietary software makers understand how far they can go with proprietary incorporation before the copyleft provisions trigger. Uh, but it's not intentionally being vague. It's just, you know, we have, we have to focus on our priorities for what our mission is. All right. Let's thank John. Thank you.